I'll work on my health plan enough to destroy it. The next enemy inside is over-caution, the timid approach to life. Timidity is not a virtue. It's an illness. And if you let it go and go and go, it'll conquer you, leave you without a promotion. Timid people don't get promoted. They don't advance and grow and become powerful in the marketplace. And it's possible to conquer it. Do battle with the enemy. Do battle with your fears. Do battle. Build your courage to fight what's holding you back, keeping you from your ambition. Do battle. Have the courage to fight back. Be courageous in your life and in your pursuit of what you want and who you want to become. Here are a few techniques to help build your courage. Number one, put all remote possibilities out of your mind. Don't worry about things you have no control over. Don't spend your time thinking about all the bad things that might happen to you. Don't spend your time plotting and planning ways to make sure these things will never happen to you. Courageous people don't worry about the unlikely, things out of their control. They concentrate on what they can control. Number two, face your fears before you start something. Imagine difficult situations before they occur. Make a list of the worst that could happen, and you'll probably see that it's not so bad after all. A friend of mine lost everything a few years back, home, cars, possessions, Antiques, art, jewelry, credit, lost it all. So now, on her way back up, whenever she's faced with a tough decision, she asks herself, what's the worst that can happen? And guess what? She's already been through the worst and survived, so it's not an issue anymore. Now, you don't have to lose everything to lose that particular fear, but what I'm saying is, once you face your fear, you can move on. Once you've itemized out the worst that could possibly happen, you'll see that you have the inner strength to deal with it. And if you've looked at the possibilities beforehand, you'll probably never be faced with the situation at all. Why? Because you've already thought about it. You've already thought it through. And by contemplating what might happen, you'll chart your course to make sure that it doesn't. So the first courage-building technique is to put the remote possibilities out of your mind. The second, to face fears beforehand. And the third technique to build your courage is to imagine the alternative. See in your mind the end result of giving in to your fear. Really feel the cost of being ruled by fear. Then really feel the gain of following your ambition courageously. Weigh the two. See the difference. If you've been invited to address your national sales convention and are scared to death of public speaking, what should you do? Well, you could decline the invitation, knowing full well that your fears are holding you back. Or you could take some classes, read some books, practice in front of a video camera, and see yourself stepping up to a whole new league, gaining more notoriety in your field, increasing your opportunities for future success. Once again, it's your choice. Be fueled by your fears or face your fears. It all depends on how you can live with yourself, always afraid of taking the next step. When you plot out your course for success, you know that there'll be some touchy moments when fear may get the best of you. But remember, if you use your visual chain thinking, if you can see your future ahead of you, if you really want what you're going after in pursuit of what you'll become, if you really have ambition, then you know that true success comes from taking the enterprising route. Subscribe to youtube.com front slash triple B media for more great videos. Thank you. As we're talking about the principles of building your ambition, let me give you the fifth one, working with others. The fifth principle for building your ambition revolves around working with others. Now, why do you think that your ability to work with others has an effect on building your ambition? This may sound a bit like a paradox, a contradiction, 
especially since we've stressed self-reliance and taking personal responsibility for all you do. But a successful life does involve other people, family, associates, kids, parents, employees, friends. Working with others or living with others or spending time with others means that you must also take responsibility for your relationships. Take bosses, for instance. How many bosses do you know that'd be totally lost without their secretary? Quite a few. They're a team. One takes the spotlight. The other is invaluable behind the scenes. One's a great idea person. The other a great detail person. They work together, or it wouldn't work at all. Of course, you need to be responsible for yourself and to yourself before you can be responsible to another person. You need to be the best you can be so that you can bring your absolute best to any relationship. And that's the tie-in to building your ambition, building yourself so you can build mutually beneficial relationships. It's like we said before, you can't be successful by yourself. And with that in mind, let's talk about a few ways to build relationships. Most of these tips are for building business relationships, building contacts, building good working relationships with colleagues, with vendors, with prospects, with future clients and present clients and past clients, building relationships. But remember, we are all people, regardless of our profession, and many of these tips work well for building other relationships, too. Let's start with kindness. How kind should you be? As kind as you possibly can. Who should you be kind to? To everyone you come in contact with. From taxi drivers to hotel clerks to waitresses to store clerks to people on the street and people in your office and people at home. Be kind to everyone. And here's why. A kind word goes a long way. Somebody's having a bad day and you don't know they're having a bad day. But somebody's really feeling bad and you offer up a kind word. Maybe it's just a friendly, hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around. Might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. People will remember, whether you know them or not. If you're in a crowded restaurant and you're especially nice to the waiter, guess what? He'll remember you next time you come in. And then guess what'll happen? You'll get even better service. When you give kindness, it's not gone. It's invested. It'll come back to you two, five, ten, a hundred times. Kindness, it's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Now, here's what else is important. Sensitivity. Being touched by the experiences of others. Being sensitive to others. Understanding the plight of others. Opening up your heart and your mind and your attention to address the needs of others, the people you work with, the people you live with, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing if you can what's going on in their heart. If there's a problem, you've got to be sensitive enough to ask some questions. Not one question, but many questions. Sometimes you won't even get through to the root of the problem until you've gotten two or three questions deep. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third and maybe a fourth, before trust builds. And the person finally understands that you do care. 
Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on, what's really on their mind. Gosh, that saves so much time, asking questions up front. Did you ever talk for an hour and then ask a question, found out that you just wasted the previous hour? Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impress builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. Identification. You want to be able to relate your thoughts and philosophies and experiences to someone who'll say, Me too. I know what you mean. You don't want their reaction to be, So what? If you're meeting someone for the first time, you're simply getting acquainted, making contact. Here's where you start. Find something you have in common. Find something you can both identify with. Start with where they are before you try taking them where you want them to go. So if you're trying to talk to somebody who's been stricken in the heart and you've had this experience, you can talk about being stricken in the heart. And it'll mean something. It'll have substance. It'll have depth. And if you start there and then start building the bridge, you have identification. Then you start building rapport. And when you start building a rapport with someone, or when you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skills. You'll need the skills that'll help you work better with others to achieve their goals and achieve your goals. You need effective communication skills. Let me give you a few tips on good communication. Because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying. Interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. And you've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere, one sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two in saying it well is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice, practice. Part of what I teach in sales training is practice. Practice. You start with something simple. And when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. Let's say you're in sales and your presentation's not that good. And you wander around saying, you wouldn't want to buy this, would you? I'm telling you, maybe if you say that often enough during the day, somebody might say, well, maybe I would. What are you selling? Now you can't say, mind your own business. No, once you've opened the door, you've got to go through it. Here's what happens if you practice in sales. You're bound to make sales. Somebody will say, what are you selling? And you've got to tell them. Maybe they'll want it. You're bound to get better. If you practice, you'll get better. You'll get better at your sales presentation. You'll get better at listening to your prospect. You'll get better at closing the sale. You'll get better at earning a living. Practice is just as valuable as a sale. Because here's what's valuable in sales. The skills. The sale will make you a living. The skills will make you a fortune. So, practice your presentation and your ability to communicate what you know. The people out there who say, no, I wouldn't care for any, are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice your presentation. And especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to you practice while you stumble around. So, 
Be thankful for the no's. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams and the future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. If you trade the hammer for an axe, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. And your best communication tool is your skill. So practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. The next part is repetition. Now here's another part of saying it well. Brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much, just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out. The more you know, the briefer you can be. Because you can learn to make words more effective. Jesus was brief when he was putting his team together. He just wandered around the countryside, and every once in a while he'd see somebody he wanted on his team and said, You follow me. Now that's short. That's brief. Now, why could Jesus be so brief and yet be so effective? Here's what I think. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. When you become bigger, when you become wiser, when you become stronger, you become a person of better reputation, so that when you arrive, maybe your reputation has preceded you. And when you get there, you don't have to say much. You don't have to launch into a two-hour harangue if your reputation has preceded you. Your reputation will get a lot of the job done for you before you ever arrive. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style, a variety of styles. Then make sure you develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary. We can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words, vocabulary, you can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Now, most of the time you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, Make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Several years ago, some of my friends took a survey among prisoners, some rehabilitation program they were working on, and they weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. Interesting. This is what they found. The more limited the vocabulary the more the tendency to poor behavior. Wow. When you stop to think about it for a moment, it makes sense. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight. And only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't use tools you don't have to see, to create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, vision. You can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Can you imagine the mistakes he'd make in judgment? He'd say, here's how it is. You'd say, no, that's not how it is. Here's how it is. The guy says, but I can't see it. How come he can't see it? 
He doesn't have the vocabulary to understand the translation. Now, vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head. Translate our questions, translate our answers, our perceptions, what we see, to be able to say it. And I'm telling you, if you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So you'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. And your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, not having the vision, not having the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got, this little narrow world, making mistakes every day. Why? They can't see. Getting it wrong every day, they can't comprehend. They can't understand, no tools with which to translate. For good communication, number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Should you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? A lot of the decision-making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read, how well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. Doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting. What they are doing with their hands, their eyes. A guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down and frowning. You've got your work cut out for you. This guy's not going to be easy to reach. The lady's standing up from behind her desk. You've got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. Here's the second one. Read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. To be a good parent, you've got to be a good listener. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now, what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little softer. Find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words, not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen. Pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Now, here's the third way to read your audience, and that is to read how you feel. Emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. Woman says it doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. She says, it's something. He says, something, something. What is this something? She says, I'm telling you, something doesn't feel right. Now, men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotion. Learn to read what others are feeling so you can adjust your communication, so you can adjust your approach, so you can get your message across, so you can communicate well. Communication, having something to say and saying it well. 
Communication is one of the key ingredients in being able to work well with others, in being able to build our ambition by working well with others. Now that we've talked about some basic communication skills, you need to understand how best to apply them. What you can do and cannot do in the marketplace. How you talk and act while playing volleyball on a Saturday afternoon probably isn't the same as how you'd talk and act around a group of people who want to invest in your company. How you communicate with your old friends and family members is probably an abbreviated version of how you should communicate in a high-powered business setting. When you meet a new group of people, you must watch and listen and be alert before you decide on the appropriate communication style. You might greet old friends with a slap on the back and a tasteless joke, but you certainly wouldn't greet a multi-million dollar opportunity that way. You must take a few moments to study the temperament of your audience. Listen to how they communicate with each other. Watch how they react to situations and comments. Study your audience, lest you engage in some behavior that will prove inappropriate and costly. Some people would make about $150,000 a year, but they have to be satisfied with about fifty, because their behavior is costing them the rest of it. They've got the skills, but their behavior is costing them. Keep setting them aside. So let's talk about some of those things in the marketplace that might cost you more than you want to pay. Here's one, bad language. You've got to be careful with language in the marketplace. You've got to be careful here. Some language is more appropriate for the bar. So what should you do? Leave it in the bar. Or else what? You'll have to pay the consequences. We must all be students of consequences, things that cost us, and language is one of the most important ones to consider, language in the marketplace. Now, if you cuss and tell dirty jokes in the marketplace, that's acceptable to who? Other people in the marketplace who cuss and tell dirty jokes. You've got no problem with them. Matter of fact, they'll probably enjoy having you around. But if you cuss and tell dirty jokes to those who will be offended, then what? They certainly won't want to have you around. And what happens then? It'll cost you. Next one, being late. In some circles, it's acceptable, but I'm telling you, most people view being late as being disrespectful. Disrespectful of their time. And if they feel that you're disrespectful of their time, they'll also feel you're disrespectful of their business. Why? because everything affects everything. Now, if you have a legitimate excuse and your reputation already says that you're punctual, then you might get away with it a time or two, but be careful about being late. One day you just may be too late to close the deal. Be on time. You've also got to be careful about using inside lingo on the outside world. Your industry's buzzwords are just that your industries. Be careful not to use this terminology on the outside. People who speak computer language, they've got to learn to shift gears when they go out into the open marketplace. So watch your lingo. Remember to shift gears from the inside lingo to the outside world. You've got to become a good judge of character. Why? To protect yourself. There are shepherds, and there are sheep, and there are wolves. And we must be wise and understand that some wolves are so clever, they've learned to dress up like sheep. But do not miss the story of the full drama of life called good and evil. Awareness, sensitivity, understanding, knowing the scenario, and being on alert for what is called the inevitable. We must learn to be a good judge of character. And here's something else we must learn to do to work well with others. We must learn to deliver criticism and express anger in a safe way. It's inevitable, 
during the course of working with others, it's inevitable that you'll come across some situation that'll result in anger or criticism needs to be handed down. It's just a part of life that you delegate some responsibility and through either a lack of good communication or a lack of good listening on the other end, it's inevitable that some situation will get you all hot and bothered. Now, what do you do with your anger? You can't lash out. You can't lash out at your children or your friends or your colleagues. But here's what you can do and here's what you must do. Lash out at the problem or the situation. Honey, you say to your teenager, you know I love you, but what you did was wrong. I hate it that you took the car without asking first. And I especially hate it that you got a speeding ticket. What were you thinking? So whatever the punishment might be, make sure you're punishing the bad deed, not the person. Your assistant ends up sending the contract to the seller instead of the buyer. Make sure your assistant knows that you appreciate him, but you don't appreciate the wrongdoing. Whatever criticism you hand down, whatever anger you're processing, make sure that the one to receive it knows full well that you care about the person, but hate what they did. And if you're too steamed up, to be this rational about it, make sure to keep your mouth closed until you've cooled off a bit. In Dale Carnegie's book, The Leader in You, he describes the attributes of kind criticism. He quotes Andres Navarro's technique of kind criticism as the three-for-one rule. If you don't like something about the way someone works, write down the problem. But before you confront that person with criticism, discover three good things about the person. Noticing three good things gives you the right to criticize one bad thing. Interesting thought. Criticism after appreciation. With well-delivered words, well-chosen words, you can admonish the doing without admonishing the doer. This is important. You love the person, you hate the act.